right, now we're back. Hopefully ha people have something to say. <laughs> I see Angel made us some comments of uh, in the chat there about uh, the same time, maybe it's based on probabilities. We have eight out of 10 won't decompile. Yeah, I think it's far fewer than that won't decompile, but they still know there's two people that can. Um, and, and, and which is what Isaiah was getting to is, and I think where Jackie was really going to is, just because we know people can de decompile, they can, you know, no matter what, nothing is ever fully safe, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't somewhat protect it, <laughs> right? It's uh, just because people can break into your house doesn't mean, well, I shouldn't have any locks at all, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Nor should we also show them the keys and say, by the way, here's, you know, here's an easy way to do it if you want to. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like your your insurance uh, will most likely not cover if nothing has been broken into. If you just left your door open, right. mm, yeah, you know, right. you'll probably have to um, cover most of it yourself or whatever, right? It, yeah. It's, yeah, or at least explain it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a good analogy. Did have anybody? Uh... Anybody have any other questions for Geek2? Or again, if you have you been working on something you want some help with, um, or just to, to touch on? Fair enough, and if, if you don't, but yeah, here's, here's the chance. I, I really do love Cloud HK and also some of your roadmap there in Kiku. It, uh, it really seems like a great idea. Absolutely. Um, awesome stuff. Yeah, I, I had a thought at one point at the beginning when you started talking about wanting to do more with um, Cloud HK, but I don't know if you actually covered it or what it was, but uh, I can't remember right now. It's irritating, you know, it's there and then it's not. Um, something. But yeah, I, I do believe there's, there's quite some things and compiling option online. I've, I've actually had at least a need that, of course, as you said yourself, you can get a portable version and, and you can solve it. But yeah, you know, there's just some times when make a lot of sense well I, I think it also again because it would be such a rare thing that you know to offer you might get people using auto hotkey because suddenly they can this is available in auto hotkey and not another language like i know with python which i talk about a lot in, in like the in, intro to, to auto hotkey tutorial i did um it's like an hour long it's a great you know hey if you're new to it it's great but at the very end of it i talked about how easy you can right-click and compile. And when I first tried to compile something in Python on a Windows computer, like, holy cow, it's it's a lot of jumping through hoops and, and you name it. I mean, it's just, it's not fun. Um, and and apparently that's a somewhat common thing, right? To, to, to go to compile something. It's not, it's not normal to just right-click and say compile and have it, especially have it, work and be portable to other Windows computers, you know, across OS systems um, and work as reliably and consistently. So it is a unique thing, I think, or one of the unique things for AutoHotKey. Yeah, Python is another one of those languages where you can just decompile it and get the source code back, by the way. Mm. Um, and compiling Python, I, I definitely feel your pain there, Joe. It, you know, it's funny because I I switched from, not switched, but I, I I learned auto hockey first, and then I started learning Python. You know, I think for the average person, when they're not used to it in auto hotkey, they just accept it, right? Like, oh oh, now I got to do this, now I got to do now I got to do this, and find this library and do this. But when you start an auto hotkey and you get used to right click compile, um, it's yeah, it's uh, off putting to say the least. Um, if nobody has other code they want to discuss, I'd be more than glad to share how I actually build Cloud Auto Hotkey. Sure, go for it. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing that. It is a very 
uh, let's just say the steps are comparable to a large staircase. Um, so well, that, that sounds like a bad thing to me because, you know, if you've ever been, I mean, you know about modern pipelines and things, having that quick, you know, shoot me an EXC and see if it works is, is really <laughs> nice. When I, I do have a button for that, but it oh, takes okay. about it takes about ten minutes to run. I'm gonna geek dude, I'm gonna print you up a shirt that says I have a button for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've got a button maker. If you wanted me to make a button of it, I could send you one, Joe. That's awesome. Um but yeah, cl cloud auto hotkey combines so many different tools that the, the tool chain is very long and very wide. Um, it started with uh, not even, you know, every component of Cloud Auto Hotkey has been replaced at one point. Um, it started with Google Blockly. Um, and you, you can see some resemblance with the drag and drop, but c comparatively, I'd say that Blockly is kind of ugly. Um, so I, I fiddled around with it for a while and uh, eventually ceased development for time reasons. Um, but when I found out that there were forks of Blockly, such as Microsoft's fork, which is the one I'm using now, um, that made Blockly nicer to use, nicer to look at. Uh, let's see if I can find here. Can you share something for us? I forgot you weren't looking at my screen anymore. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, hold on, share screen. Just describe yeah. it. Oh, yes. Uh, Google Blockly here. Um, you can see there's a lot of the same drag and drop components. Um, but it's, like I said, it's kind of ugly. Um, Google put a lot of resources towards this. None of them came from their design department. <laughs> um, but compared to you know, Cloud AHK, you can it's not the tab. You can see that there is some resemblance. You've got drag and drop snap together, drag and drop snap together. Um, and it's because it's using a fork of Blockly that you get that. Um, so it's using Microsoft's fork, which is a fork of MIT's fork. It's, it's very complicated. Um, but the, the end goal is that people who are familiar with MIT Scratch um, get put into a familiar environment. Um, so look and feel being similar to Scratch has been a big, uh, a big goal of the project. Um, when my it, son was like nine, he was using Scratch and, and building loops and doing stuff. It was really impressive. If we look underneath here at what Scratch is using, uh, you can see here it, it's using Blockly underneath. Hmm. So uh, but basically, Cloud Auto Hockey is Scratch at this point. Um, so I, I took that editor component um, from Google, and I did some tests with it. And that stayed up on cloudautohockey.com for about a year. I had owned the domain for maybe another two years before that, before I put anything up. Um, and it was really Fast. ugly and didn't work particularly well. Um, and then, uh, you know, one day I saw, oh, there's there's a better way to do drag and drop editing, more like Scratch, more user friendly. And that really kicked off my train of thought that snowballed from there. Um, 
if we look at Microsoft's fork here, they have instructions on developing and building. Um, so you use Git and clone the repository. You check out some other stuff. You have to use NPM, the node package manager, to get some more dependencies and pull it all together. And I, you know, I, I looked at this and I just said, that's a lot of stuff that I don't want to install on my computer. Um, and so what I did was I grabbed this other tool called Docker, um, which is used uh, by a, a lot of backend developers to build, uh, build code that runs anywhere, basically. It encapsulates the code and makes it so you can move it portably from machine to machine without um, messing up the host system. So I pulled all of the Blockly stuff in and all of the other dependencies in and threw them into a Docker setup. Um, so Docker is built around Linux. So when you're using Docker, you use a lot of Linux commands. Um, so it starts with a container based for using uh, Node.js. And it installs all these tools that we need to build the site like, uh, well, NPM comes free because it's Node.js. Um, but it also installs Ruby and it installs uh, you know, HTML minifier to shrink my code and all sorts of other tools to where you can have a full development suite and none of it touches your host computer. Or at least it doesn't touch it except for where you tell it to. Um, so my uh, build process here is separated into a couple of different shell scripts, Linux shell scripts, that because I'm using Docker, I can run on Windows just fine. It handles all of the, the backend stuff to make that work. Um, and so it goes and it builds that dependency, uh, Microsoft's PXT Blockly. And then step two, I have a call to a tool called Jekyll. And what Jekyll does is it takes a bunch of fragments of web code and it sticks them all together to build a full website. Um, and then stage three, I take that built website and I run it through uh, a bunch of different minifiers and code cleaners um, so that when you go to Cloud AHK and you hit view source, um, this is what you get. It's all been compressed and stripped to fit in the smallest space that it can. Um, if we go into the editor and look, uh, this one it's managed to put all on one line. If we look in the files here, See if I can find a JavaScript one. So blocks.js here. This is a JavaScript file where everything has been kind of shoved together. Index here, same deal, JavaScript. It's all been compressed and shoved together. Um, and that happens just automatically as part of the build process. Uh, getting it to that point was one heck of a ride though. Um, now I, I kind of glossed over Jekyll, but for anyone who's doing web code, I, I think it might be a bit more important. Jekyll is what's known as a static site generator. 
Um, when you use something like PHP to build a website, it has to build that page every time someone looks at it. Uh, whereas with Jekyll, it builds it once and then saves that and you just give people the built page instead of building it on demand. Um, and I'm using it here uh, because it's good at taking tons of separate fragments and putting them together into a full site. Every block in Cloud AHK is a separate file here. Um, here we have the code that it uses to show in the block picker. Here we have the code it uses to uh, build the block for the uh, for the workspace, this area here. And here we have the code to generate the, um, the well, generate the auto hotkey code from the block. And by using Jekyll, I can take all of this, put it together in the same file, and then make a separate file for every block. It pulls them in see here. This is the editor web page. Uh, that one. This page here. And this is the web code for it. Um, and all of the where, where is it? There we go. all of the code to populate this sidebar gets added using one of these Jekyll includes. All of the code for the default blocks in the workspace get added through a different include. Um, and if you've written HTML much, you know, th this isn't something that you can really do uh, with just plain HTML. Um, if we go look in our toolbox, which is this include here, we can go to the includes folder and take a look at that. Uh, we can see a lot of code that doesn't look like HTML. Um, and that's because it's not. This is going and finding that block file and pulling the right part out of it to show up here. Um, and so I can have everything kind of spread out, uh, but it still gets pulled to the right place in the end. In my own experience, it's also really nice to have them in its own file because you can get there really fast with the uh, Visual Studio editor or probably, you know, most editors. It's a lot For easier sure. to look up a file than to scroll up and down using Control F. Where's that function? Exactly. Um, and when I want to make a new block, uh, it's real easy. I just look for a file of a similar block and I just copy that file, rename it, and, you know, kind of go at it. Now I have a new block. Um, anyway, so it takes all of that from the source folder and it drops it out into this folder called dist, uh, short for distribution, distributable, etc. cetera. Um, and if we look inside this blocks.js, you can see it's pulled uh, all the code from these block files. So here I have the individual block file uh, CMD sys git. You can see that's been put in at line 743 of this blocks.js. Um, and it's really important that everything gets condensed down into as few files as possible because of how I package it into a portable auto hockey script. We're, we're bringing it back to auto auto hockey here now. Um, 
if we take a look inside this file here and scroll down, here I have to use the file install command and list out individually every file that's needed to make the page load. Uh, I've looked for a better way to do this and one has not presented itself to me yet. Um, so that, that was a primary driver in getting everything to pull together automatically. Because instead of having you know, six dozen file install editor slash this block editor slash that block and one more place that I need to change whenever I add a block. Right. Um, it just gets pulled into blocks.js and I can file install that pretty easily. Um, now, I'm using file install in a kind of strange way for anyone who's used file install before. Uh, here I have my auto execute section up at the top. And then I have my return at the bottom of the auto execute. And then I file install everything. Um, these lines never get run by auto hotkey at all. Auto hotkey just never makes it there. But they're still important because they tell the compiler to include those files in the exe. That's funny. Yeah. And then Cloud AHK, the desktop script, can load them <clears throat> can load them straight out of the exe without extracting them first. Um, as for how it does that, uh, it's this Neutron library that I wrote. Um, and I'll go ahead and pull up that. You just got a couple big thumbs up, by the way. I don't know if you saw, but yeah. And actually that, that general concept, uh, Geek Dude, I was, I was gonna say, I think a couple people are, would love to understand that a bit better, right? Because it, that's a pretty cool functionality. For sure. It, having scripts be as portable as they can be has been a big driver in my development practices. I want AutoHotKey to be some big available thing, but when you go and download a script and then, you know, 30 other files appear right. in your directory, right. Um, it's kind of a turnoff. Um, and then having a, a script you run and then suddenly there's a bunch of temporary files on your system. Even if you can't see them, it's still not a great thing. Right. Um, so Neutron was built uh, kind of with Cloud Auto Hotkey as the end goal. Uh, but it's, I, I've written a bunch of documentation and packaged it up for people to use for their projects too. Uh, the idea is that you can build your entire auto hotkey GUI just as HTML. Um, and so here I go, I create a new neutron window in the auto hotkey code and I tell it to load editor slash index.html. Note that I'm using a forward slash here and a forward slash there. Uh, that is necessary for it to work when compiled because of Windows. Um, but when it's a non-compiled script, loading it like this looks in the local directory but when it's a compiled script, and I'll go ahead and compile this so we can look. Um, if we pull apart the exe here in resource hacker, we can look in this RC data folder. We have this file, uh, angle bracket, auto hotkey script angle bracket. 
And that is the uh, source code for the script that you would normally see if you open the exe and scroll down in Notepad. Uh, but we also have all these other files. And those got thrown in by AHK to exe because these file installs were somewhere in the code. Um, so they get thrown in, and they get thrown in with this forward slash in them. And when you're referencing a file in Windows, Windows doesn't really care if you're using a backslash or a forward slash. But when you're referencing one of these files inside an exe, Windows suddenly cares a lot if you're using a forward slash or a backslash. Um, so all these files get included in that exe to where when you load it, Everything you see here was pulled out of these files, not these files. And I can demonstrate that. Uh, just go into a temporary folder here so it's away from all those other files. I run it and it still works fine. Um, so. How, Big how points does that, for portability. Yeah, how does that load function then look? How does it do it? Let's take a look at the code. So this is that load function. Um, and it's fairly short. It checks if it's a compiled script. Yeah. If it is, it uses um, the resource access protocol. Um, and if that is completely foreign to you, then uh, good. It means that I wasn't just oblivious when I first heard of this. Um, this is a feature that only exists in Internet Explorer. You can't do it in any other browser. <laughs> um, and what it does is it looks inside the resources of an EXE and extracts some kind of data. So all of these items that you can see here in Resource Hacker can be reached in Internet Explorer using that protocol. And as for what that looks like, um, well, let's just open Internet Explorer and demo it. You have to take the executable path. Uh, and run that through a uh, through an encoder. So you encode that so it's URL safe. And then you go to the URL res and you paste in that path and then you do a forward slash, and then a number corresponding to the resource class. Here, the number 10 means RC data. How do you see that it's the number 10? Yeah. Trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, it, it took me a good half hour of messing around with this before I, I stumbled on the formula. Uh, the number 10, and then the name of the resource you want to access. And then you hit enter, and it loads that up. Switch to view source here, just to that is wild, dude. You're make a it easier to look. Um, but yeah, I discovered a new way to decompile auto hotkey scripts. <laughs> 
it, well, and, and more importantly, to, to come, well, whatever, however you want to phrase it, this, this topic a alone. bundle in a weird way. Yeah. Could be a, a webinar in itself of such high value, like to everyone using it to me, like it, it just suddenly to your point, right? It's yeah. We, even I know how to, uh, you know, configure something to, to download in separate files and make it work. But I wholeheartedly agree. You don't, you, the fewer the files, the better. Right. Um, and yeah, packing it all together. That's, that's freaking awesome. Love could you, it. could you use that to what load, load an image binary data? Oh yeah, for sure. And that is something does that it. I saw it with that little quote image. Hmm. See if I can grab that resource there, paste that in. Well, I, I've just grabbed a 1.1 pixel image. Nice. Let's try this again with a different image. Uh, this one looks good. Grab this quote. Nice. Loads up just fine. So if you're building an auto hotkey script that uses an embedded browser control where you want to load some image, uh, this technique may be very high value to you. Cool, 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 Leo. Yeah, true it is. Um, I, I've mentioned a couple times now the differences between the web page and the Neutron script, the, the desktop portable script. Uh, and uh, so far, I haven't shown anything to justify how there's a difference there. You know, how do we get title buttons here? Um, and that's, uh, I think, an interesting subject for anyone who wants to do something similar in the future, which is have a website that also has an accompanying, uh, accompanying auto hotkey script. Uh, and, and the answer is fairly simple. All of those title bars uh, and other elements, the box at the bottom, the run button, they all exist on the page always, but they have this class set on them, Neutron. Mm -hmm. And the default CSS for that is display none. So anything with that Neutron class is set to just not display my file go. When viewed on as a web page. Right. Yeah. But when um, viewed as an app, you know, the when app. When viewed as an app, that's the, the key phrase there. I have this bit of code here that just loops through every neutron element and removes that. That's kind of uh, contradictory because it's like, if you have the yeah. class name of this library, don't show it. You think it would be the other way, or yeah, um, or uh, remove the, it so that it is shown. So right. Kind of, the trick is in the CSS where it's like, don't show it. But then we, anyway, that's that's pretty crazy. For sure, um, and by far that's not the only way you could have done this. Um, but that kind of idea where you build the page with all of the code for you know, all your platforms in it and then selectively show some depending on the scenario, uh, I, I think it could be useful for people doing the same kind of thing in the future. For readability, in my opinion, it seems like maybe you just uh, change that CSS property instead of remove the entire, uh, whatever uh, you call it. But uh, you yeah, know, that's, that's fair. Uh, that's definitely fair. Uh, on the other hand, I, I, I'm saying all this like 
this is so someone else could do it in the future. And, and then is anyone but me really doing this kind of thing? <laughs> Some of it might happen. Not yet, but you know, for anyone who wants to do a really slick GUI, I think this is probably the way to go. Um, for anyone who's trying to build a website and an accompanying app, probably you're in a, uh, a room by yourself at the moment. Yeah, basically I, I am uh, soon going to start a project in which I think I'm going to be using uh, a web-based GUI. Um, and a lot of the things that you have mentioned uh, seemed like a very good tool that I could use later on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've put a lot of work into this Neutron library specifically to promote that other people do this kind of thing. Um, and it's seen some traction so far. Uh, we're on page two of the forum now. We have two pages. It's progress. Yeah. Hey, page two on the uh, scripts forum is, uh, you're getting somewhere. So that's uh, a kind of deeper look at Cloud Auto Hotkey for our second half. Super nice. I think we're at the mark anyway, if, if we wanted to, Joe. Oh, he's talking without his mic. Fair enough. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank, thank you, Geek Dude. That was uh, really, really interesting stuff. Um, yeah. Very, very cool. Like I said, I, I think I know because with Isaiah, as we're, we're working on a couple projects where we're like, I think we can borrow from several things you shared. Um, and, and those of you who I think actually everyone here was on the, the, the web of the previous webinar where Geek Dude went into Neutron. You know, on the second hour of I, was that even the one last one? I I can't recall now. But um, you, you did a deeper dive into Neutron itself and creating pretty GUIs and stuff. So there there was a lot of stuff there that you covered in it. Did anybody else have any other uh, questions? Not really. Awesome, man. Well, thank you, Geek Dude, and everybody for being here. Um, yeah, it was great to be here. Yeah, we are very appreciative for your sharing. And and next time, guys, you know, anyone else, if you got stuff you're working on, right, bring it here, especially if you're stuck on something and want to learn a concept um, or, or want to propose a topic, um, just let us know ahead of time on that one. I actually uh, think that maybe next time I'm going to show you uh, a small tool that I, I have to to improve yet, but it was kind of like a um, uh, an inventory manager for a store in which you can actually even uh, track the purchases and stuff. It is uh, something that I've used for a long time before moving to a, an e-commerce site. Um, so probably there are some interesting things in there that you might have a look at. Maybe next time we're going to talk about that. stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Geek Dude. Very yeah. Awesome. yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Beast. Really Absolute thing. resource to the community, man. You're yeah. cool. Yeah. It did. Awesome. I'm just glad. I, I know I've talked to Geek Dude a lot, and he does, he, he probably does 10 times the amount of what he's sharing, right? And like, uh, you know, <laughs> It's getting getting more of the stuff out into where he's sharing it is. Yeah, I bet if you looked at the Neutron library, it's probably like already a year old. Like when when's the first commit on there? Do you remember? Let's look here. Uh, May sixteenth was the first commit for this yeah. iteration of the project. Yeah, so you're like, yeah, after being rebuilt like two times, the first commit is already a year old and he only introduced it on the forums like, you know, three or four months ago. So 
for every one minute you see here, he's got like months of work. Uh. It, it, it was really nice. Yeah. Helps to just see stuff like that. All right, everyone. Let's go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll see you uh, next month. Thanks again, Geek Dude, and everyone yeah. for being here. Thank you very much. We'll see each other later. Have a good day. Yeah, yeah bye.